Well, if you could turn to Isaiah and chapter 50, you've probably forgotten now, but I spoke on verse 7, or began to speak, where the Lord is, well, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah records words that will speak very prophetically of Christ. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I want to continue with that subject this evening and, and see what truths and applications there are in this for us. But we're going to read the chapter for context again. And if you read this chapter, there's so much in here which speaks of the Saviour. Isaiah 50 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I, sold, I have sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions your mother has been put away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no, none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, with my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Well, let's come to God in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for that precious teaching the Saviour gave on the Emmaus Road, where he opened the disciples' eyes to see himself in all the scriptures. And we thank you that he is everywhere, the Saviour. And we pray that we would see him this evening again in this verse. And that we would be encouraged. And that we would be challenged, but challenged in a very positive way. To endure the Christian life. To run the race. To strive to enter through the narrow gate. To not look back like Lot's wife. But to be ever looking unto Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last time we, we were in this text, I have set my face like a flint. And we saw that it spoke of a resolve in Christ, an immovable, unbreakable resolve to, to press forward in the plan of our salvation. He, he, he would not be set aside. He would not be moved from the track. He, he was resolute. You cannot just break a rock. He was immovable. The one who says to us through the Apostle Paul, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, was himself absolutely immovable. And we considered that it is vital for us in our own discouragements and in our own difficulties and troubles to consider him. Who endured, as the scripture says, such hostility against himself from sinners. And we, why do we consider him? Well, lest we become weary and discouraged in our own souls. That's what Hebrews 12 verse says. 
For, he goes on, we have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. His point being, not even the cross made Christ waver in his commitment to save you. You know, there's a, there's a big, I, I remember having this misunderstanding myself for quite some time as a Christian. The, in Gethsemane, what you have is not Christ wavering in his commitment to his people. Let's be absolutely clear about that. What he is wavering about is the prospect of the cross. But it's not, I'm not sure I want to save these people. No, no, that is without question. His question is, is there any other way to save my people? It's not even up for discussion whether he wants to save his people. His agony is, must it be only in this way? But once he receives the confirmation Having asked three times, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because when the Apostle Paul says, I pleaded with God three times to take away the thorn, he wasn't willing to pray any more than three times. Why? Because the Son of God prayed three times in the garden for the cup to be uh, removed from him. And so when we consider that, that not even the cross made Christ waver in his commitment to save our souls, this is an encouragement to us to press on whatever the Christian life brings our way. Considering him is really, really good medicine for a weary, discouraged, tired, worn down Christian soldier. And we saw last time, what we began doing was, well, what were some of the, the threats, if you like, to the Lord Jesus? What were some of the, un, the, 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 the things that sought to undermine Christ's steadfast resolve and we considered what were those realities and how did Christ resist them and we saw three things last time the first reality that Christ had to deal with and contend with that came to him to make him turn from the track was the temptation of the world you know, the crowds would have made him king without going to the cross they would have uh, given him praise, they would have seated him on the throne, they would have followed him wherever he went, they would have lavished him with everything he wanted if he would be their earthly king and their earthly messiah. These were temptations uh, for the saviour, for you can be sure of that. Then there was the discouragement of his friends. How discouraging were his disciples to him? Um, how disappointing it was to see the pride in his disciples and the, the failure to understand things he taught them over and over again. You know, when he, when he, he had to feed the 5,000, there was the 4,000, the 5,000, but, but still they, they weren't understanding. He said, did you not remember what happened last time? The Lord Jesus had so many discouragements. You know, he could be forgiven, couldn't he? To think, is it really worth going, it, going through all of this for them? And then when, the Lord, when Peter says to the Lord Jesus, you know, far be it from you, Lord, you, you can't go to the cross. Well, if that's how you feel, if you don't seem to have any awareness of your sin and your need and the fact that there must be a lamb that takes away the sin of the world, then why should I bother? So little conviction, so little sense of need, so little understanding that there must be the shedding of blood if you are to have a place at my right hand in heaven. And then thirdly, the condition of his people. You know, when you see all these miracles, healing the leper, um, casting out the demons, what you're basically seeing is this, this, these, all these conditions picture the condition of these people that he came to save. Those that walk in darkness, those that are paralysed and spiritually disabled and hostile to God, unable to love God, they can't muster up any, any passion for him. Blind, deaf, lepers are, are contaminated, they're not able to be among the people and be in the temple, we are defiled before God. This is the people for whom he came. And every time he was confronted with needy souls, he would have seen more than what the physical reality was. They would have illustrated to him why he has to go to the cross. And yet he steadfastly set his face like a flint. And of course, Dr. Luke in his gospel, in the gospel of Luke in chapter 9 and verse 51, actually quotes Isaiah here and says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. But there's more stumbling blocks that came in our Lord's way, more, you could say, temptations, more trials, more testings to shake him and try and make him break from his resolve to love you and give himself for you. And that's what we're going to consider this evening. And the first consideration, the first temptation, the first threat, you might say, that was presented to him to break him was his bitter experiences. 
By bitter experiences, I am distinguishing bitter experiences from difficult experiences. All ex bitter experiences are difficult, but not all difficult experiences are bitter. Does that make sense? For example, I, I, I can have a difficult day. I could get in the day and say, oh, you say, how was your day? Well, it was really hard today, you know. Oh, so many problems, the children were difficult, you know, and uh, my phone didn't stop ringing and I, I had this. But it wasn't a bitter day. It was just a frustrating day, a difficult day. By bitter, we mean experiences that make your tummy churn. Agonising trials and testings and events and providences that make you feel sick. They're bitter. They, they grieve you. Your soul feels tormented. Now these are difficult indeed. Betrayal is bitter. Betrayal of a closest friend or a brother or sister. False accusation, that is bitter. Adultery is bitter. Scorn is bitter. Ingratitude from those you've poured yourself out for is bitter. And none of us, whether we've had experiences of those kinds to some degree or other, bereavement's bitter. That's another one. There's, there's tons more you could probably think of. But none of us, whatever measure we've had of bitter experiences, has had a cup so bitter <coughs> as the Lord Jesus Christ. And it would be a sermon in itself to just unpack all the bitter experiences that the Saviour endured. I will just mention a few. Firstly, the response to his ministry. He comes to his hometown Nazareth. Is this not Mary's son? It's not Joseph's son. Friends, this congregation consisted most likely of his cousins, of his second cousins. For those of you who know historical strict and particular Baptist circles, this is your classic um, chapel where everyone's related. Aunties and uncles are in this, this chapel. There's people he played with. There's people he walked to synagogue with. There's people that babysat for him. There's people that held his hand. There's people that came to his birthday party here. This is his familiar friends. This is his hometown. And, 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 and what, was it? what was his sermon? Was his sermon harsh? Was his sermon cruel? Was his sermon... I mean, there was some hard things he says, but he announces his sermon by reading the following in Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, what's, what's the Spirit of God anointed me to do? I'll tell you what he's anointed me to do. To preach good news to the poor, the gospel to the poor. So if you're poor here, poor of spirit, if, if you feel downtrodden, if you feel uh, needy, if you feel unable to do anything to please God, if you feel totally bankrupt in your soul, I've got good news for you. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Are you broken with your life? How did you get here? What's gone wrong? You're, you're grieved over your sin. You're grieved over your shortcomings and failures. You're grieved over the sin you've committed to others, let alone the sin that you've committed against God. And of course, all sin is against God. Well, I've, sent, I've been come to heal you. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Do you feel beset with addictions and patterns of sinful behaviour you just can't overcome? Well, I, I can give you liberty. Recovery of sight to the blind. Does the scriptures which you've been taught from infancy, do they seem so shut up to you? Do you see no glory in them? Well, I can give you sight and you can see treasures and wonders and you can see things you've never seen before. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Do you feel fed up with dead religion of the Pharisees? Laying on you burdens that you cannot bear, but not prepared to lift one finger to assist you. Well, I've come to preach liberty for you. He closed the book. He sat down. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, all bore witness at the gracious words that he spoke. So this, this was a gracious sermon. 
But then he has to convict them of sin, you see. And he goes on to speak, compare them to the generation of, uh, in Elijah's day, of the hardened Israel. And look what happened in this local chapel. All those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, anger, hatred, malice, murderous thoughts. And they rose up, thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. That would be like you guys running me up the beachy head to throw me off. And my body smash on the floor, my brain spill on the ground. I'm being graphic because I want you to see this was what they wanted to do to Jesus of Nazareth. Someone they knew. That was how bitter this was for the Son of God to be rejected. John says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Now, many of you in this room, I'm sure you know this. I've had some degree of experience of this. You know what it is to face some degree of rejection from family because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a bitter thing when a Christian parent is called evil by their children for raising them to know God. It is a bitter thing when a family member effectively cuts you off for following Christ. This is, this is gut-wrenching stuff. Some of us it's happened, some of us it may yet happen. It is a bitter thing when you seek to do good in the church and minister to your brothers and sisters in small ways and great ways and they reject you and call you evil for doing good. This is bitter. And I'm sure we've all known this to one degree or another. But what does the apostle say to the Hebrews? Consider him. Because what's mind-blowing is what we read next. Passing through the midst of them, he went his way. I will never make mention of the good news again. I will speak no more. Now, what does it say? He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. He went into more synagogues. He ministered to more people. He set his face as a flint. He continued doing good. He continued doing the will of his father. He continued seeking his lost sheep. I must be about my father's business. I must preach in other cities also. I must proclaim good news. Does this not encourage us? Because which of us has known bitter providences like the Son of God? Remember him coming into um, Jerusalem and they, they say, oh, Hail the King of David! Hosanna! Hosanna! And the same crowds that welcomed him cried out, Crucify him! How bitter! And yet he said his face as a flint. He loved you to the very end. He loved his own to the end. How bitter it must have been for the Son of God to wash the feet of Judas who would betray him with a kiss. And yet he, he loved him. You see, friends, considering him is so helpful when we go through bitter providences. Because what one of us can claim First of all, to be worthy of anything better. I mean, as I remember a preacher once saying, whatever they say about you, it's, it's, it's not as bad as the truth. And um, I have found that very helpful. And, uh, you know, remembering these things, thinks, well, he, he endured all this for me. Is he not worthy of my continuing on the track, on the path uh, for him? So it's bitter, ex bitter experiences. These were... Uh, and, and the response to his ministry, the second bitter experience was the insults he received. Have you ever thought about some of the name calling? I've only mentioned a few. There's tons more than I've got down here. In John 8, verse 41, he was called a bastard. The Pharisee said, We were not born of fornication. They're implying that he's a bastard man, bastard child. We all, we all know that Mary and Joseph. We were behaved immorally before marriage. You're not the son of God. You're a bastard. That's what they're saying. 
how, how painfully, how bitter. And then in verse 48 of John 8, I mean, this is, this is just one encounter the Lord's having and he's getting us all in one exchange. Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? You're pure evil. He who was good through and through, he who was love incarnate, he who was God in the flesh, the, the radiance of the Father's glory, the Godhead dwell bodily, he whose heart is only love, he who would have gathered them if they would have received him, they called him evil, demonic. You know, some of us are going to be called evil for believing biblical norms on on manhood, womanhood, all these, all these things. This is where the battle is today, that when we stand on these things, we're going to be called evil. We're going to be called bigots. We're going to be called unloving. This church could get a reputation in this town. Are you prepared for this? The church of bigots. In Mark 3, verse 21, his family call him insane. He's gone out of his mind. He's mad. That preacher, that church down there, they're a bunch of um, insane folk. And in Mark 15, verse 16 to 19, they mock him as a charlatan king. Might want to turn there. Very moving narrative. Mark 15, verse 16. The soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium. And friends, they maul the Son of God. They literally maul him. He is their king. He is the Lord of Lords. And he allows them to do this to him. He is sustaining them as they clothed him with purple. They twisted the crown of thorns, put it in his head. They salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. They're mocking him. They struck him on the head with a reed. They spat on him. And bow in the knee, they worshipped him. This is all a joke to them. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him. Put, on it, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Are these not bitter experiences, bitter insults? How painful these things must have been. And yet he said his face is a flint. Whatever the people said, whatever they said, he knew what was true. To so the Pharisees, he said in John 8, in, in verse 38, I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. I know who I am. I've been reading the scripture since childhood and the father has opened my ear and taught me who I am. I know who I am. I remember what he said to me at my baptism. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Say what you will. I know who I am. In Isaiah 50, in the chapter that we're looking at, there's even some context to this. Verse 4, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He, he awakens me morning by morning. Beloved, the importance of daily consecutive reading of the word of God is vital to setting your face as a flint. The Lord Jesus didn't just have conviction by magic. He learned who he was and what he was called to do by reading of himself as he is as father and the spirit unfolded him in the Old Testament scriptures. And it is that which gave him conviction. Why do you think so many of his sermons quote scripture? It is written. It is written. Thus it is fulfilled in your hearing. Conviction is absolutely essential to steadfast perseverance. And conviction comes by what? The word of God. The word of God. The third bitter experience, of course, that I want to mention this evening is the atonement itself, the cross itself. Could there be a more bitter experience? How many of us like to be blamed for things we have not done? I've all recently had the experience of disciplining one of my sons and then finding out after it wasn't that son. It was the other son. Oh, the pain I felt and the pain my son felt. To be blamed for crimes you've not committed. Who can, be be who can bear to be thought of as a bad person? How many of us can endure for five minutes a bad name or a bad reputation, especially if it's not true? I know this. I've had my name talked about before. 
there's pulpits that have been shut up to me that I've been to and they, I've been put on a list of ministers not allowed to return. I know what it is to feel these things and it, we, 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 we get really angry and defensive. To have a bad name, to have a bad reputation, these things grieve us. Well, beloved, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, that doesn't mean he became a sinner, but it means that God counted him as the worst sinner that has ever stood before him. He was made in the sight of God the most, con- most vile and awful and, and wicked and depraved and disturbed man. The very sight of the Son of God by virtue of the imputation of all my iniquities past, present and yet to be committed upon him and yours made him the object of complete and utter scorn. Not because he had sins in himself, let's be clear again, but he was reckoned guilty. He was st- stood before the bar of God's justice and found wanting. Why? Because he was found with my sins and your sins on his shoulders. And God smite him and God condemned him and God poured out the bowls of wrath and the eternal fury that has been stored up. And placed it all upon him. Though he was completely innocent, a lamb without spot and without blemish. Could there be anything more bitter then than enduring the punishment for crimes you have not committed? But that make that's not that that is bitter. But let me go a bit further. He is experiencing the punishment at the hands of his father. I can't imagine what it would be like for me to slay my son for crimes other people's sons have committed. Now, the illustration falls down because there is a difference in that Christ really and truly had a union with his people. And and, and that's the difference in that, that it was just for God to smite his son because he was so one with me that my sins became his responsibility by virtue of his headship over his people. We were his people and are his people, and therefore, by virtue of union, he had to pay for our sins. Though, of course, that position he had was a position he entered into voluntarily. Can you imagine the the pain and the agony and the stomach-churning pain to be counted as the worst sinner that has ever lived? And yet, he set his face as a flint. And on the cross, when they mock him and they scorn him, he says, Father, Father, Abba, Abba, forgive them for they know not what they do. Familiar words, but do you understand what he's saying when he says those things? By saying forgive them, he's saying destroy me. You can't forgive without the remission of sins. So even in the act of bearing the wrath of God, he is still willing to bear more of God's wrath in order that his people might be forgiven. Complete atonement thou hast made, and to the utmost thou hast paid, whatever thy people owed. How then can wrath on me take place if sheltered in thy righteousness and sprinkled with thy blood? You have, some of you have been through awfully bitter experiences, more than I've ever known. And I don't know what you've been through. But I do know this, you have not been through anything as bitter as the cross. You haven't. Whatever it is, you cannot present me with anything in this world that is as bitter as the Son of God being made sin, who knew no sin. And knowing it as he was bearing sin, it's pleasing my father to do this. <coughs> the sting of death is sin. And he bore it all. What a bitter sting it was. The second, so that was the first point, the, the, the bitter experiences he faced was a tremendous, you could say, pressure to make him turn away from the path. The second hurdle, you might say he had to jump, was his visible exit route. 
his visible exit route. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes when we endure difficult situations, we endure them and we see them through because basically we have no alternative. We have no way out. A man is in a job that has demanding hours. It's difficult. It takes sleep from him. It keeps him from his family. It consumes him. What can he do? He cannot find an alternative. He looks. He scales the newspapers. He looks at the online adverts. He's applied for some things. Nothing's come back. What can that man do? He has bills to pay, children to feed. The man's hedged in. And so he endures it. Out of love for his children, love for his wife, love for his God. He has no choice. He has no exit. He has no way out. Some of you have known bitter providences like that, where you were left in a situation, there's nothing you could do about it. It was what it was. But it wasn't like this for Christ. He had exit routes available to him many times. The first one was Pilate. And I'm not giving him in a logical order here, I'm just giving him in the first one of, of priority, if you like, not, not, not chronological order. Pilate. Pilate was desperate to release him. Do you know that? Pilate was not too happy about the idea of crucifying him. All the Lord had to do was to open his mouth. And, and reason and explain and call in the eyewitnesses when the false accusations were brought. And Pilate would have released him. And of course there was the dream that his wife had that warned her. Pilate was very uncomfortable with the idea of crucifying him. It is only when Jesus kept silent and then the crowds called out for Barabbas that he saw that he had no hands and he was almost superstitious that he said, I wash my hands of this, I'm innocent. He understood, this is not good, I shouldn't be doing this. All the Lord had to do was open his mouth and bring clarity and bring, bring explanation. And yet what did Isaiah say in chapter 53 in verse 7? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. That must have been a temptation. Just to, I think if I, if, I was, if I was a Lord, I know, I'd have been like, come on, I'd have been, you got it all wrong. <laughs> that would have been my sinful reaction. That would have been my fleshly inclination to clear my record, to assert my innocence. He's like, well, they're not be, I might just be, that'd be your reaction, it'd be all of our reaction innately. But our Lord just, now there is a place sometimes for clearing our innocence. The Apostle Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. The difference was, it's not that it's wrong sometimes to defend your reputation or to defend your honour. The Apostle Paul spent his whole letter to the Corinthians effectively defending his apostleship because the gospel was at stake. The Lord Jesus, though, knew that to do so would have set him away from the cross. He would have been released. And he was foreordained before the foundation of the world to be the lamb who would be slain. And so the Son of God didn't take that exit. Though humanly, at the human level, it was there for him. The second exit he had, you could say, was angelic help. <coughs> angelic help. Let us remember that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of hosts. He is, as Joshua saw, the commander of the Lord's armies. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read that the seraphim veiled their faces before him. Jesus said to Nathanael, I tell you, you will see the Son of Man and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's obviously picking up on Jacob's vision. We've seen that in the past here. Um, the, the ladder, he is the ladder. And the angels are going up and down on the ladder. But what that means is Christ is the one who sends angelic assistance for his people from heaven to earth. And they come back to heaven, receive their orders, and Christ sends them to be ministering spirits sent out for those who are to inherit salvation. So they respond to him. They, they do his bidding. And if the Son of God had cried out, help me, rescue me, on the cross... The sky would have lit up with the angelic host, myriads of myriads, and there would have been a spectacle that would have made Putin crawl into, the, into a cave and said, hide me from this force of heaven. And yet, as they mock him on the cross, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. 
Oh, you're pretty prophetic, pretty impotent. Who's, gonna, who's helping you now? Where have all your disciples gone? Where are the armies of heaven? If you are the Son of God, will they not help you? Does he not give his charge over you? Six hours pass, and he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took no way out. He set his face as a flint. And that's not the case for you or me, is it? Because even the most um, troublesome paths that you or I walk, every trial, every temptation, every uh, grievous path that we have to walk, we're told in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, he always provides a way out. If we endure discipline for a moment, our momentary troubles, there is a way out. It may be death. That may be the way out. But that, that, we've all got that in one sense. A whole life is trouble, isn't it? <laughs> you know, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. Life is trouble. We have death coming. That, that, that's Paul's point. We have a, it's momentary. It's, it's, it's like a blink of an eye. A day is as a thousand years. When we've been in heaven, t- 10,000 years, that weight of glory will swallow up. The troubles will be forgotten. The former times will be forgotten. But even many of our temptations, many of our circumstances, they felt like they would never end. And the Lord brought us through. The Lord brought us out. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men, Paul says. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's one of the great reasons we persevere, because we know our Father is mindful of us. And he uh, allots us our trouble proportionate to the strength that he will give us to bear it. But our Lord Jesus Christ took no way out. The third exit, you might say, was his divine power. And as I'm, as I'm speaking these out loud now, I'm beginning to think this should have been first, actually, in terms of priority. So there you go. It's not precise mathematics here. Many of us are in trials because we're basically powerless to change them, aren't we? You get diagnosed with a condition... We say, I have this sickness. I've prayed about it three times. I've, I've taken the medication. I've seen the doctor. There's, there's not much more I can do. I'm, this, is, this is it. This is my lot. This is my circumstance. It's not in my power to take it away. I'm powerless. And so we endure because we must. But not our Lord Jesus Christ. His, his setting his face, his perseverance was not because he was powerless or because he was a victim. He says, no one takes my life from me. No one. But I lay it down of myself, of my own accord. I want you to know that, he says. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. Do you remember when he calmed the sea with a word? Do you remember when he said to Lazarus, come out? Do you remember when he said to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand? Or my favourite, when a legion of soldiers came to arrest him in the garden. Estimates are at least a hundred. hundred men to arrest one prophet from Nazareth. And he said, are you, they said, I'm paraphrasing, are you Jesus of Nazareth? Are you the one they call the Son of God? Uh, Jesus says, ego en me, I am he. What happened to those men? All hundred of them. They fell down to the floor. These are hardened Roman authorities. These were, these, were, these were seriously hardened men. And just Jesus saying, I am Yahweh or Jehovah. They collapsed to the ground at the weight of his power. It's almost like he's just making it very clear. Just so you know, if I come, I'm coming of my own accord. Not because I'm powerless. I am laying my life down because I love my people. He had the power to stop it, friends. He really did, but he didn't. Doesn't that make his love more amazing? Doesn't that make what he did? There was nothing about... that. There wasn't any moment in his last hours where things were spiralling outside of his control. It's not like when Pilate said, fine, crucify him, and the cross is on his shoulders, that at that point the Son of God can do nothing. At that moment, he could have... He could have ended it by the word of his power by which he made all things and by which he sustains all things. 
Does that not make his perseverance even more astounding? That he willingly endured all this for you and for me. What kind of love are we dealing with here, beloved? What kind of passion? He held the highest place above, adored by all the sons of flame. Yet such his self-denying love, he laid aside his crown and came to seek the lost. And at the cost of heavenly rank and earthly fame, he sought me. Blessed be his name. What a glorious saviour he is. Consider him. Does this not produce some desire in you to endure whatever it is you've got to endure for him? Can we not set our faces as flints? And actually, this is what the Lord calls us to, you know. Strive to enter the narrow gate. Do not let anyone tempt you aside. Put everything, if you're striving for something, what does that mean? It means you're, 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 you're all in. Striving for the prize. Uh, uh, you're striving to get your A in your GCSE examinations. You know, you're, you're working round the clock. Nothing, you're giving up food, you're drinking Red Bulls through the night. You are doing whatever it takes to ensure that you get the mark you want on your paper. You're striving. He says, strive to enter the narrow gate, for many wish to go through it, but will not find it. Will we not persevere for him? I love this verse from a hymn, God only, know, God only knows the love of God. Only God knows the love of God. Oh, that it now were shed abroad in this poor, stony heart. For love I sigh, for love I pine, this only portion, Lord, be mine, be mine, the better part. <clears throat> Friends, you are not hard done by whatever you are going through when you have been loved like this by the Son of God. And I know that in saying that, some of you are going through horrific things. I don't say that because I know. I say that on the authority of Scripture. That if you are in Christ, he, is being, he has been and he is being gracious to you through it all you know the apostle Paul what did he say what was it that pressed him on what was it that made Paul set his face like a flint well our version says for the love of Christ compels us I prefer the authorised version for the love of Christ constraineth us Paul is saying that I've, I've come to know sufficient not, not all the love of God that I could but what I have come to know it constrains me on this path I cannot turn back knowing that I've been loved by him like this. Because we judged us that if one died for all, then all died. What are you saying? I'm a dead man now. My life is not my own. Because he died for me, I am dead to the world. I'm his servant. I'm his slave. And I will endure all things for him. Consider him, who is the author and the finisher of our salvation. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, <clears throat> we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been on holy ground as we've considered his, his passion for our souls. We thank you that this subject can never be run dry or exhausted, but it is a fountain with no bottom. It is, a, it is a, an ocean so vast that we will, not even eternity will we have exhausted the love of God in Christ for us. We pray, Lord, that you would shed abroad that love in our hearts, that you would give us a vision of the one who steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem, whose face was like a flint as various things came before him to try and turn him aside. We thank you that we see in the Lord Jesus this unwavering resolve to lay down his life for his people <laughs> And we pray then that we would have the same resolve to live our lives for him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.